May the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, my Lord and Redeemer, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. Well, today I ended up with a topic to share with you this morning, but I, at the very beginning of the week, I felt like uh, Dory in the movie Finding Nemo. Like, oh, look, over here. Oh, look, something over there. Uh, or as we basically say, people have this squirrel problem. There's a squirrel out there. Well, I was writing one section, and I, I read the epistle for this week, and it struck me that I was going to concentrate on something else. So I played the part of Dory. Uh, and hopefully I won't change my mind as I'm halfway through this morning. But I wanted to focus in because the epistle has such a beautiful statement in John about love and how we should be behaving uh, with not only relative to God but to each other. That brought me back to what I always say, and I (laughs) I sort of made a sermon out of it. Christians must have smiles on their faces. I thought, well, that's good. I keep saying that. Why don't we talk about it a little bit? Well, I went back, uh, found a few things, and I've added the screw tape letters so you know that it's grounded in something with C.S. Lewis, but let me take you back further. In the fourth century, there was a monk, and he was named Ibegrius. He identified the key, and you all know what these are, you just didn't realize that a monk in the fourth century actually wrote them down. The key temptations against, uh, about living the Christian life. He named eight of them. I don't know why he stopped at eight, but he named eight of them. And they became the eight deadly sins until, until Pope Gregory the Great said, no, we don't have eight things, we have seven. So they're now the seven deadly sins because that's what the Pope said. I'm sure uh, whatever he said at the time, Vigory said, okay, you got it. So what did they do with the eighth one? Well, the eighth one, is really an interesting situation because the eighth one was actually called the sin of sadness. That was combined with the seventh one. It kind of disappeared into the seventh one. But Egregious actually wrote the eighth deadly sin was the sin of sadness. Sadness, the way he looked at it, sadness in the face of God's grace and mercy was a denial of faith and hope. That was a sin, a deadly sin. Sour pussed Christians are creating the eighth, or now the seventh, deadly sin. But it isn't the vice that concerns me, it is corresponding virtue. And I love the Latin that they used at that time. That's, you know, I don't know if any of you had to learn Latin in school, I remember very few Latin words, but we had to converse with each other in Latin. Actually, it was a beautiful language. Everything's so well organized. Not quite like English, but. It's very well organized. And he talked about the corresponding virtue to his eighth deadly sin. And he called it the blessing of hilaritas, which I thought was kind of cool. The blessing of hilaritas against the sin of sadness. He said that was essential to Christian living. Even if you were an ascetic monk, and especially if you're a lawyer or an accountant, that's an important thing to remember. The place of humor and laughter in the Christian journey can lead one down the path to destruction or it can lead to the pleasure of God. Sourpuss Christians are heading in the wrong direction. They're sort of passing us on the path. Mm, I'm going to trod this way and we're smiling going the other way. We need to understand we're not going in the same direction. As a matter of fact, in the Westminster Catechism, It defines the primary end of man, and I love this phrase because it it goes back to the fourth century, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Christians with a sad face can't do that. Matter of fact, they can't enjoy anything. Did you ever find a sour Christian that enjoyed anything about life? They're usually the ones that, uh, as Father had mentioned, the problem with the tongue. (laughs) We want to talk about the negative stuff about people. That makes us feel better, doesn't it? I'm more superior, and I'll get to that in a minute, if I talk up downward toward people. Now, if I consider them equal and love them, that's not so much fun because I can't elevate myself in human life. Well, how many of us have actually enjoyed God today? I don't mean prayed to him. I don't mean being faithful to him. I'm talking about enjoying him. You don't think he wants you to enjoy him? 
Can you imagine how he laughs at us down here? Well, we ought to have some enjoyment back towards him. Now, one recognizes the laughter in the scriptures as treated. If you read scripture, laughter is kind of a vague, I'm not sure exactly what's being said. So you have to look at the context. And much of the laughter is mocking. Christ was always going after those who laughed at people in a mocking way. The author of the Hebrew book of Ecclesiastes warns that although there is a time for laughing, there is also a time for crying. It is better to, and I love this reading in here. I was wondering if I would really like this guy uh, after I went through it and started to realize what the writing was about in, a, in the sense of laughter or the sense of enjoying God. Because as you look at it, it is better, I think, that he was expressing uh, his ideas to attend funerals than to, att than to attend festivals. Advise the prophet, if you will, that wrote this of negativity. There's a detective story about a young woman, I forget the name of the books, but Patricia used to read them all the time. And the young woman's mother was the epitome of an Italian New Jersey woman. If you want to think about a classic that people always draw somehow, they're not real, but they draw them. And she and her best friend, and they must have been in their 60s or 70s, what did they do all the time? They would go to the paper, find out where the funerals were, and attend them. And as the book would be written, they would come back and talk about whether they had good cookies or they didn't, <laughs> etc. It was sort of like, let's go to this one. It's, uh, so, you know, I'm Italian, they're Irish, doesn't matter, they got cookies, we can go there. It's a good thing. Well, that's what he was talking about. Well, not quite in that way. It is better to be miserable, according to Ecclesiastes, than to be happy. She's also the one in Thanksgiving that pulled out her pistol and shot the turkey that was on the table. But you have to read the book to, to understand it. <laughs> She's in New Jersey. Uh, it is better to eat thistles than to eat cake. Don't you love that? Oh, no, I don't think so. It is better to be miserable. And a lot of people love being miserable, don't they? They're happy being miserable. That's really kind of peculiar. Sorrow, quote, sorrow is better than laughing for sadness has a refining influence on us. So let's all just be sad. We're much better Christians if we don't like ourselves and we don't like anybody else. The, the author does not seem to be the best guy to bring to a, as a dinner companion. I think that'd be pretty depressing to have him sitting across the table from you. Well, in the very first Psalm, we are warned not to walk in the counsel of the wicked. If you go to the book of Psalms, stand in the path of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers. It's not like those, don't you have that alliteration that goes on? However, in the very next Psalm, very next one, which confuses all of us because you read them and it sounds like there's cross paths going on. We're told, quote, he who sits in the heavens laughs and the Lord scoffs at them. He who sits in heaven laughs. So why are we miserable down here? Woe to you who laugh now. But let's put that in context because Jesus said that. Woe to you who laugh now. He'd said that in the Gospel of Luke, if you go to Luke. Was his caution targeted against laughing or being happy? No. If you read the context, it was a judgment about the Pharisees who laughed at. There's a difference between laughing with and laughing at somebody. So when it's quoted, well, you know, we're not supposed to be, no, 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 I'm sorry, that was about Pharisees. Are you a Pharisee? I don't think so. So laughing is a good thing. Jesus denounced those who had hardened their hearts now in the presence of God. He admonished those who asserted their superiority over others and neglected justice and kindness. Woe to them and to the lawyers who compound burdens as well. Because by the way, the Pharisees were usually the legal folks, just, just to let you know. As in all comedy, though, and this is important in scripture, a good comedian will tell you timing is the key. Did you ever have somebody try to tell you a joke and mess up the punchline? And you're going, oh, you know, because you really, oh, come on, timing here. Give me, deliver the punchline when you're supposed to. Just a few verses earlier in the Beatitudes, a comic reversal takes place. Sort of a harbinger of the hope, if you will. For humor, Jesus promises laughter 
to those who suffer, believe it or not. If you look at the, the correct translation, it says, Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. I wonder why he would say that to us. We're supposed to be kind of like that. No, that's not what he said in the Beatitudes. Laughter is itself not a vice to be condemned. It's a reward for those that believe in Christ. It's your reward. It's what God is giving you. The significance of laughter is that it must know its time and place. Laughter really is a reward of, a hum of the humility of a Christian and dependence upon God. It descends like rain upon our hearts. Did you ever get, uh, what's the terms that we use in English, like the term giddy? I like that term. Where you just kind of feel like, you know, and, and, and the hairs are standing up on the back of your neck and you're, you're just feeling like this is really cool and happy and great. Well, that's what, that's what the Beatitude statement is all about. Get giddy about Jesus Christ. Blame doesn't shower people with a sense of humor, but rather what I would call in the language of the screw tape letters, those, and this is from screw tape, those well-fed and stiff-necked souls who assume superiority over others in the church. Now, he's not talking about clergy. He's talking about parishioners. Oh, I'm better than this person. Wow, well, I mean, look at that dress. Or yeah, this guy wore that shirt three Sundays in a row. Um, good heavens. So, to the apostle James later literally explodes in his warning to hypocritical sinners. I love that. Quote, chapter 4, 8, 9. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. He was being hypocritical. He was chastising. He wasn't telling us that's what we should do. In the epistle to the Ephesians, St. Paul warns against foolish talk, what is translated as morologia. Best illustrated by the fool who says in his heart, there is no God. See, I'm better than you because you're fools. You believe in some kind of mythology out there. And I'm much more superior. I can laugh at you because there is no God. Such talk actually is damning for that person. Paul also warns against the twisting of the good, eutropelia, where virtue and justice are perverted for laughter. And if you look at any comedian on television now, what he warned us about, eutropelia, is happening. Laughter is always the edge of change. That's what humor, uh, humor is all about. You make fun of something that we're not quite sure of yet. It's always the edge of anything that's changing. On the other hand, it, let, it can be used as an instrument of destruction. And I'm not sure that that isn't happening a lot with humor nowadays. That's what he was warning about in Ephesians. However, in Philippians, Paul commands what? What does he say? Rejoice. Now, that's a cool word, isn't it? Then he goes on. And again, I say, rejoice. He calls forth the heart of the sing out of the gratitude and laughter. The great Roman Catholic journalist, if you've ever read anything you should, of G.K. Chesterton, explained how his laughter of joy was necessary. And I love this phrase. If, uh, again, if you want to put some other, I know you've got a whole bunch of bumper stickers I ask you to put above your doors, but here's another one that you might want to try. He says, life is serious all of the time, but living cannot be. Isn't that cool? Life is serious all the time, but living cannot be. What did he mean? He went on to say, you may have all the solemnity that you wish in choosing your neckties. That's a good thing. But in anything important, such as death, sex, religion, you must have mirth or you will have madness. So be serious about the stuff that are important but not consequential. And guys, be giddy about your friends, your family, your husband, your wife. Just, just like timing is key. You don't want to get giddy at the wrong time. By the way, there's a good instruction for that. I don't know if you're back in the 50s. And, well, you guys are too young for that. But way back in school when they still had uh, whatever it was called, uh, home, ec home economics, I loved one of the instructions. It was a cool instruction because everybody wore aprons back then. I don't think anybody knows what that is now. But anyway, they wore aprons. And what was the instruction? If you were angry at your husband, you wore your apron backwards. So when your husband came home, he would go, okay. 
<laughs> so you have to be giddy about it. You send a message. It's, it's sort of like, I'm not ready to talk to you right now. And the husband probably is like me, dumb enough. And he goes, hey, how you doing? Oh, wrong. No, take a look at the apron. Wrong. However, there can be those who believe that Christian laughter should be forbidden. There are still denominations that believe that. Certain church fathers did, our church fathers, did hold dim and frowning views of laughter. For example, and even though I truly love his rule, if you read it, the 6th century rule of St. Benedict said this, As for coarse jests and idle words, or words that lead to laughter, these we condemn with a perpetual, perpetual ban. I don't think so. I love his rule of life. But if you take his rule of life and you're not laughing while you're doing it, as Chesterton would say, it leads to madness. It leads to madness. Dante. I don't know if you ever read Dante. It's actually a cool book. Everybody goes, I can't read it. It's funny. It's like reading Shakespeare. It's cool stuff. Anyway, Dante buries sad people in what he calls the black mud in hell. Sad people are buried in the black mud down there in hell because they had remained so stubbornly gloomy in the sweet, glad air of God's Son. As he leaves the realms of purgatory and follows, if you remember the book, Beatrice into paradise, Dante hears a sound he has never heard before. Celestial laughter. The laughter of the heavens as he's going to paradise. The reason for the fall, if you will, is the sin of pride. I don't know about you, but that's a hard one for me. It's a built-in Western tradition to be prideful. Now, to have pride is good. To be prideful is not. That word is very important. Where everyone takes him or herself way too seriously. Way too seriously. Satan, Chesterton reminds us, fell through force of gravity. He took himself too seriously. Pride drags us downward in an easy seriousness about ourselves. I need to go to church, but I got to go there because I know that some of my business associates are there. And so I've got to be there. It's like if you ever, again, going back to before you were born in the fifties, uh, and you, you would talk about the United way back then it was either the red feather or it was uh, United fund before they merged all of those. And I remember businessmen saying, I really don't want to go there, but if I'm not there, my boss will be there and I've got to be there. No, <laughs> if you don't have the heart to do that, that's self-destruction. Once that one little block falls, the dominoes collapse. We can't do that. Well, anyway, thus we have a picture of hell as a state where everyone is perpetually, think about hell, perpetually concerned about their own dignity and their own advancement, where everyone has a grievance, don't we? Where everyone has a grievance, and where everyone lives the deadly, serious passions of envy and self-importance and resentment. And if you've ever been in academe, I'm just described a college faculty meeting. That's exactly what they are. As Garrison Keillor, now you won't remember him, you're too young, had said, some people think it's difficult to be a Christian and to laugh. But I think it's the other way around. God writes a lot of comedy. It's just that he has so many bad actors. Garrison Keeter was right. But it is being truly serious about our miserable condition and about the hope of salvation. that it, That's where we get the surprise of comedy. We're so worried about it. The, the comedian, the comedic, use the right word, situation is that we worry about our salvation and it's already there. Now that's comedy. That's laughable. And grace arrives for Christians in the Incarnation. It arrives with the body of Christ. The Incarnation strikes a staggering blow at the Pharisees and Gnostics and anyone who denies the value of the physical world that God has created. Now, they may distort it, but he has created it in perfection. It's significant that for St. Augustine, by the way, the devil and bad angels never had bodies, ever. You see, bodies were reserved for God's creation, you, not for the angel of light. That's why he has to talk you into things. He can't force you to do anything. For the Christian, the comic spirit is one of new life. 
feasting, banqueting, eating, drinking, in the right place, timing, right? And playing. This paradise is regained when heaven is described to be like, right? A wedding feast. Don't we hear that a lot? A wedding feast or a sumptuous banquet. We're not talking about a whole bunch of people morose sitting around going, oh, woe is me. We're talking about some people that are having fun with Christ. St. Francis, and I love St. Francis. He's one of the, probably one of the smartest, uh, but certainly one of the coolest guys uh, ever to exist within the church as a saint. If you're familiar with his writings, uh, he called his, his body what? Brother S, <laughs> which is really kind of cool. Brother S, because no one in his right mind can either revere or hate a donkey. I mean, how could you hate or love? You know, it's just a donkey. It is a useful, sturdy, obstinate, patient, sometimes lovable, and an infuriating beast. Deserving now the stick, and as we see in pictures, and then the carrot. Stick, carrot, stick, carrot. So the body. There's no living with it till we recognize that one of its functions in our lives is to play the part of a buffoon. Brother S. It ushers us into humility. I hope we get that. When he said, my body is Brother S, he, he was talking about his own humility, <laughs> his own comedic existence. It's amazing. And if you think about it, humor, humanity, humility, I always like to take people back to what the words really came from. If similar, uh, actually, they came out of the roots of the words humere or humus, Spanish hummus. So humere means moisture. Humus means earth. So if you will, comedy is a living existence of the creation of the earth. If we don't celebrate with comedy what God has created through the cosmos, we are rejecting his creation as well as him. Always remember joy is the laughter of heaven, the secret of Christian life. You'd be such a great Christian if you got a great sense of humor. By the way, everybody has a great sense of humor. We just like to tamp it down. I don't want to look like a fool. Um, well, I can start calling your brother ass and maybe that'll help you think about a few things as we go through. But only, we have to think about it, for example, a brief time. Happiness can be found in worshiping, your, wor worshiping yourself with a good bottle of port next by. You know, just sitting right next to you. I am so good and drinkable sip your port. Etc. I am so important, etc. Now, does, do I banish you from drinking port? No. Do I banish you from, from wearing a beautiful dress or a wonderful outfit for the guys, uh, uh, whether it's, what do they call it, business casual or suits or whatever? No. But to take yourself seriously, and that's why you do it, yes. Laughter, like music, percolates as thanksgiving and praise. That's why we sing. That's why I get so upset when people are singing to go, na, 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 na. Uh, sit down, shut up. Let's sing bravely and wonderfully and glorify God. Our enjoyment bubbles up and overflows with gratitude. That's what hymnody is all about. In fact, our praise is verbal laughter. When you say praise God Almighty, how can you say it praise oh, God Almighty? You can't say it that way. It is praise and laughter at the same time. Now I'm talking about celestial laughter at the same time. It's also true with verbal praise. Whenever a husband, think about it, praises his wife or vice versa, uh, or someone praises, just praises a book that they've just read, that praise completes, or if you will, consummates the joy that has just been experienced. Wasn't that a good meal or a good talk or a good walk or even a decent evening? We didn't turn on the TV. We actually talked to each other. It's really a good thing. The praise is a blessed reminder of our love and laughter. As the proverb tells us, a happy heart makes the face cheerful. So what might one do to enhance one's laughter? I would say these quick things and then we're done. First, habits of humor require an encounter with the God of laughter. If you don't know God, you're going to be a miserable soul on the face of this planet. Second, 
Spend time, and there are ones like this, laughing with the saints. If you don't have a book of saints, you may just want to get a whole library of those because there are some saints out there that were just so cool. For example, St. Teresa of Avila. Or if you say Avila, some people say it that way. Prayed that God would deliver her from these gloomy saints around her. Here was this young girl that always just wanted to laugh and love God, and everybody was going, shh. Can you imagine that? I can see this upstart young girl going, ah, oh, no. I'm going to continue laughing. How about the father of Methodism, John Wesley? He preached that quote, and I love this quote from him, sour religion is the devil's religion. Now that's straight on. Inspired, no doubt, from Jesus, warning men not to look sour when they fasted. That's probably what he was relating to. I don't know that to be true, though. Be with saints who see God's grace inter interrupting their lives, who take time to give thanks for a meal, a conversation with a friend, a kiss from a spouse. It's, it, you know, it doesn't take much. The expression of love, God just wants us to express the love. Third, read and listen to historical saints, saints who display the gladness of God in what they write and say. And I would suggest, if you can't really get that done, become an actor. Start to speak like a Jewish person. And that's wrong, but that's the only accent I got. Start using the words, like, oy vey, and then read it together. After a while, you're going to be giddy with your husband or wife or just with yourself, reading it that way, and you begin to see the words differently because now they're glorious and fun and God's glory and laughter is in it. God gave you, by the way, all of you are actors. I know you well enough. So I know you got some chutzpah in you. I just need to see the joy when you start acting in the process. Fourth, fourth, do not take yourself so seriously. Remember that the opposite, the opposite of serious is not comic, but trivial. The opposite of that is trivial. And the opposite of comic by the way, the word is tragic. So Christians who are not in the lap of God are tragic Christians. That's a condemnation I don't want. The light of God's gift of laughter can lighten our load and our journey. Finally, it will bless the company of pilgrims. And I'm telling you, it'll affect other, others who want to join our joyous congregation. I'll say it to you again. Smiling Christians attract other people. Sour Christians do not. Whenever I describe somebody, you, I don't know if you do this or not, but my description always is, I like them. You know, they're always smiling. They're always happy. I don't want to be around anybody else. I want to be around that person. Because that Christianity, and I would tend to think that that's more often than not, is positive. Like the gospel, laughter is contagious and can draw people not only to God, but to each other. And that, Evagrius would tell us, is a forgotten virtue that we should practice. Christians have smiles on their faces. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.